Metairie Baptist Church. Good morning. Whether you are joining us here in the building or joining us online, welcome. What a day it is that the Lord has given us. It is a day that He has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in that. Today, no matter how you came into this place, no matter what's going on in your life, I think if we all were to take a moment to pause and reflect on this last week, we have something that we can rejoice and be glad that the Lord has done in our life. And my request of you today is that you harbor that excitement, that praise uh, towards our Lord, and use that today as an act of attitude of worship towards Him as we continue through our service. Throughout today's service, you'll find opportunities in which we'll be able to worship as we sing praises to Him in just a moment, as we pause in the midst of our service to pray, because we believe that we have a God who is alive, who longs to hear from His people and then as we open up the Word of God, we really do believe that the Word of God truly is the thing that changes hearts and lives. And you'll see that stretch throughout our service today through the scripture reading and even in a few moments as our pastor comes and teaches us from the Word of God. Uh, today is a, a unique day. It's an exciting day. Uh, and at this time, Lisa Hall, the chairman of our personnel committee, has a special presentation. As we pause to celebrate Pastor Appreciation Month, we realize that in just a minute, there's no way we can wrap up all our appreciation for, the four, for our four pastors. Thomas, we are so fortunate to have you as our leader, our mentor, our teacher, our director, and to have your heartfelt love for each of us. This has been an extraordinary year, difficult for all. We thank you for your vision of how Metairie Baptist has been able to move forward during times that seem humanly impossible. But least we forget that God is more than possible even when we're not. We are thankful to you for seeking his guidance, sustaining his work, ministering to his people, and continuing in his word. We use the use of many different outlets and means has been and continues to be your urgent goal. Even more amazing, Christ is working in us, in our church, in our neighborhood, in our community, and even further in these hard times. We thank you for keeping us immersed in his word, showing us what a wonderful God we serve. We thank you, Patrick, Carol, and Dale. Dale's up there. <laughs> for your direction, your leadership, your tireless work to minister and care for us, working day and night to bring us new ways to worship, new ways to be with our Christian brothers and sisters, bringing us meaningful, meaningful musical worship, enriching our outreach ministries, and ministering to our youth and children. How blessed we are to have such loving shepherds in all of you that has truly strengthened our walk with Christ. Please accept this gift certificate from Ruth Chris as a small token of our deep appreciation. Thank you. It's kind of a natural hug. Uh, it's kind of hard, so it's a virtual hug. Let me just uh, uh, say a couple of things quickly. First of all, as pastor, I would say being able to work uh, with these, my friends and uh, staff members, is really one of the uh, greatest honors and greatest uh, privileges I've had as a, uh, as a pastor, but really humbled to be your pastor, thankful that God's let me be here, and uh, I think you know of our love for you. We're so thankful, aren't y'all thankful for God's continued work among us, and we're anticipating his continued work in the days ahead, but we thank you. Thank the personnel committee, and thank you as a church. Do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Youth may become faint and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. Would you stand and join us as we sing this morning? Strength will rise. 
continue to sing with us about the goodness of God. I love you, Lord, for your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head, oh, I will sing of the Last week was a little different for me. I had the opportunity because it's fall break at the seminary to step away from the office there and to work from home, do some things here at church that 
don't normally have a chance to do. And one of those things that I've been challenged to do, I'm working on a project where I've been asked to write an article, write articles about the 25 people who've influenced my life. And so it's given me a chance to reflect back and to think about my original pastor, to think about youth ministers and BCM and BSU leaders and uh, my father and a whole host of people. And the thing I'm just reminded of is when you do that time, when you just take time and you reflect back on the people that God's used in your life and the way that he's guided us, I've just been reminded, perhaps in a way I haven't thought in such a long time, of just his faithfulness over and over in my life and how he's been so good to me. And I pray that as we gather in this place that we take time to have that sacred memory, that we take time to reflect back. And yeah, there's, there's challenges today and life may not be perfect, but man, God's been faithful. And we worship, we celebrate him because of who he is. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to join me. And as we get ready to pray, I'm going to ask you to pray that God would give us that sacred memory. I'm also going to ask you to pray that as we anticipate um, this upcoming weekend, that God would use this weekend for his honor. Uh, we want to do more than just have a fall festival. We want this to be an opportunity to express hope, to be able to express compassion to people that are around us. If there's one thing that we've discovered, it's simply that there are people that are hungry. They just need to know that somebody cares. And this is our chance through small gestures of smiling, behind a mask. You have to let your eyes smile, by the way. But uh, smiling or being kind, treating their children with kindness, uh, just being able to demonstrate Christ's likeness. And so I'm going to ask you to bring candy. I'm going to ask you to invite. I'm going to ask you to come join us. We're asking everybody who can to join us no later than 9.30 on Saturday morning so we can get everything together. And to be a part of the ministry, but most of all, I'm going to ask you to pray. Pray that God would use this time. Pray that God would soften our hearts and the hearts of others. I'm going to ask you to join me in prayer, and as we pray, I know that there are things on your heart. I know that we're all walking through kind of unique times, and maybe, maybe a burden, maybe someone you're concerned about. Perhaps now, in the quietness of this moment, we just take that concern to God. Ask Him to do what only He can do, and then I'll leave some prayers in just a moment. Would you join me as we pray? Father, we gather in this place today, and our testimony is that you have always been faithful and that you have been so good to us. God, I pray that in the hearts and the lives of each person that's here and each person that's listening, God, I pray that you would give them those sacred memory moments. I pray you would give them the opportunity to look back and just to remember your faithfulness. God, I thank you that as we look back, we see that you're faithful. As we look at today, we know that you're faithful. And as we anticipate the future, we're anticipating and knowing without any question that you will be faithful. So, God, I pray you'll find us faithful. I pray you'll find us faithfully following you. I pray you'll find us faithfully worshiping you. Faithfully being your hands and your feet upon this place to demonstrate your love to others. God, we pray for the upcoming festival. We pray be a time that gives us a chance to connect with people we may not have the chance to meet in other times. Pray we'd be able to demonstrate love and Christ-likeness, that we'd be able to share hope. We ask you to go before us, soften our hearts and soften the hearts of those who come. And help us just to be able to celebrate you by having a good time while we're here. God, we thank you. Thank you for who you are. We open ourselves up to you and ask you to speak. We need to hear from you today. We ask you to guide us as we go through the rest of this time together. We pray we'll leave here changed, God, because we've been in your presence. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. When it's in singing, this next song, Be Thou My Vision, I was sharing with the staff earlier this morning my you know, songs take us to places. They help us remember things. Uh, for me, one of those vivid memories of singing this song was when Promise Keepers was taking place. It's probably been 30 years. In the Superdome, there was a group gathered of about 40,000 men. And at the conclusion of a weekend of worship and prayer and 
really God did a lot of things in a lot of men's life, including my own life. We close by singing this song. The song is Be Thou My Vision. It's a prayer that God would consume us, that our greatest desire would be Him, and that when everything else is taking place, the only thing we really desire is to see Him and to know Him better. So join us as we sing this song. Let this be a commitment to God as you sing Be Thou My Vision. Sing with me. Be recognize that you are the ruler of all and we come this morning with our praises and asking you to teach us and help us to follow you more closely in Jesus name in Christ alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my soul this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving ceases, my comforter, my There in the ground, his body 
invite you to take your Bibles. We'll be looking in John. John chapter 4, we'll begin reading in just a few moments in verse 46. John chapter 4, verse 46. As you're turning, I want to encourage you what I have done repeatedly throughout uh, uh, the last years, and that is to read the Word. Uh, If you're not reading the Word on a daily basis, you're missing out on a great opportunity for God to speak to you and to encourage you, to give you that guidance and that strength. And especially this week, we're picking up, and I encourage you to join us. You can go to uh, metairiebc.org slash Bible reading. If you go to our homepage, you can see our, what we're reading next. We pick up in John chapter 8 tomorrow. We're reading a chapter of John every day. And as you read through the chapters this week, you're going to discover Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. We're going to discover uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. There's some exciting and encouraging stories uh, and truths that are found within the Scripture. So I want to encourage you to read. This past week, one of the chapters we read was John chapter 4, and that's the reason we're focusing upon this passage this morning. There's an old saying that says this, if you can keep your head when all about you others are losing theirs, maybe you just don't understand the situation. This is one of those uh, claims that perhaps sometimes ignorance is bliss. But the reality is, If others around you are losing their minds and losing their heads, perhaps the reason we are able not to lose our minds and lose our heads is because we know what the situation really is. And the situation really is that no matter what's taking place around us, Jesus Christ is still there. He is still in control. He is still in charge. He is still faithful. And we all are called to still turn toward Him. I remember as a child in Bible drill, I remembered Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3, which simply says, You will keep Him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. The Scripture is a reminder that in the midst of trials and judgment and crisis and everything else, that God watches over and He guides and He shapes and he cares for those who continue to focus upon him so he calls us to keep our minds focused upon him i want us to be able in this passage today to see this man a roman government official who is facing a crisis and i want you to see how he handles the crisis so that in turn you and i will know how to handle life's crisis as well read with me or listen as i read in john chapter 4 beginning in verse 46 John chapter 4, verse 46. So Jesus went again to Cana of Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official, a government official, whose son was ill at Capernaum, 15 miles away. And when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea into Galilee, he went to him. And he pleaded with him to come down and heal his son since he was about to die. And Jesus told him, unless you people see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And Jesus, or the Roman official then said, sir, come down before my boy dies. If you listen carefully, you can hear the moment of desperation, the angst that is found within this man's voice. He says, come down. Jesus, in verse 50, says, go. Your son will live. And the man believed what Jesus said to him and departed. And while he was still going down, his servants met him, saying that his boy was alive, his son was alive. And he asked them at what time he got better, and they replied, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. And the father realized this was the very hour at which Jesus had told him, your son will live. So he himself believed, along with his whole household, Now, this was also the second sign Jesus performed after he came from Judea to Galilee. I'll go ahead and tell you what the point of the story is this morning. Here's the point of the sermon. Trust Jesus. So oftentimes in the midst of crisis, in the midst of frustrations, in the midst of challenges in which we live, if we're not careful, we find ourselves distracted and forgetting that whether life is good or challenging, whether we can understand what's taking place or it just seems that this whole time of our life is beyond understanding, the one thing we can know for certain is that we can trust Jesus. In the story we've just read today, this true story about the life of Jesus, 
we hear that Jesus had been in Samaria. And as he was in Samaria, he had encountered a woman, the Samaritan woman. And Jesus had carried on a conversation with her and had told her that he was the bread of life, or the water, that he was the living water that could thirst that quench, that, that, excuse me, that could quench that thirst that she had. Jesus then went on and it says that he returned to his own hometown, to Capernaum, but he knew he wouldn't be welcomed there and he only stayed there a short time. And after about two days then, Jesus heads to the city of Cana. It was about a 15 mile journey from Capernaum to Cana. It was a place where Jesus had been before. We know the story of how Jesus had been there previously, how he had turned the water into wine. Previously when he had come, it was a time of great joy. This time as he enters the city, he encounters a Roman official and he discovers that instead of this city being a place of great joy, it was a time of great sadness, a time of great angst in the midst of the life of this Roman government official. A man who had found himself at the end of himself. A man who simply did not know what else to do. And in the midst of not knowing what else to do, he did what you and I are consistently called to do. And in this passage, you'll find there are two key reminders. The first reminder is simply this. You and I must do what this Roman government official did. And that is that we must always seek Jesus. We must always seek Jesus. I mentioned to you earlier, I've had some time off this week. It's really not been time off. It's been a change of pace. I've been upstairs a lot in my study, working and thinking and working through some things. In the process of doing it, I would occasionally come down to get something to drink and take a break. And by the way, water or something like that. I don't know why I feel I have to clarify that. I, but anyway, just in case I needed to clarify that, I want to make sure for the record it's clear. Uh, but anyway, I'd come down to get some water to refresh me because I had been sitting there studying. How about that? And uh, occasionally I would kill a few minutes and I would surf through television. And one of the things that I enjoy, most of you know I enjoy cooking shows. I have come to discover that I like Justice TV. Uh, this is essentially judge show after judge show after judge show. What, what the show shows us is several things. Whether it's Judge Maybelline or Judge Mills or Judge Judy, all those shows show us the depravity of human beings among us. They also show us that people really don't know how to handle crises in their life, and they wind up on television hoping somebody can help them handle it. And you and I do the same thing oftentimes. We know that in the midst of a crisis, we know that every moment of our life, what we need to do is seek Jesus but oftentimes, we'll seek everything else before going to Jesus. We'll even seek fellow church members because, after all, they are the religious people that we know and they should help us. And by the way, I want to encourage you, seek out good followers of Christ and listen as they tell you that what you need to do is seek Jesus because the answer is found within Him. Now think about this story. This is a Roman government official. This is a man who probably had wealth at his disposal. This is a man who had plenty of connections. This is a man who was known for his own power and his own authority, for his own ability to accomplish things. And what he discovered is that he was facing life, and during life, none of those things, not the amount of power that he had, not the amount of connections that he had, and not the amount of resources that he had, none of those things were sufficient to meet the crisis head on. Somewhere he had heard the story about Jesus. He had heard that Jesus was a man who could not only do wonders, but he had heard the story that Jesus was without question one who could bring hope to hopeless situations, one who could help in the midst of crisis, one who was ever present, ever caring. And this man found himself at a point where he needed help and he goes and he seeks Jesus. Notice that when he recognized his need for Jesus, he takes a 15-mile hike in order to encounter Jesus. Now, you and I, in our modern minds, we think you can jump in the car and drive that. Some of you can drive that 15 miles in 10 minutes. Others of us take a little bit longer to get there. The reality is, is that Jesus walked that, or the Roman guard walked this by his own self, by his feet. He put in effort. He made a decision, a conscious decision, that not only was Jesus the only one who could provide help, but he made a decision that he was going to go and find Jesus. 
It wasn't enough simply to know him as a solution, but instead he sought Jesus out. Now let me remind you when you look at this story. When we seek out Jesus, it means that we come to a point in our lives where we come in humility to him. Here's a man who had authority, who had position, who had power. And the only way he could come to Jesus is to come to a point in his life where suddenly he found that he was a desperate person in need. You and I, when we come to Jesus, we daily come to him, not because of our self-sufficiency. We daily come to Jesus simply because we need him. This Roman government official faced this situation in which he looked and he said, there is nothing I can do about this, but I know someone who can. And the only way he could come to Jesus is to come in humility and humbleness to bow before Jesus and to ask Jesus for him to do what only Jesus can do. I do want to encourage you in our lives that as we come to Jesus, it's necessary for us not to come with our preconceived ideas. It's necessary for us not to come and tell Jesus what he needs to do. But instead, it is to come to Jesus and to lay ourselves before him and to say, Jesus, we come desperate to you. You alone are the one who can walk with us through this. You are the one who can provide the guidance. You are the one who can provide the encouragement. You alone are the only one who can work in such a way that you get the glory that you deserve. And so this man came and sought after Jesus. The Greek verbs that are described in this said that when he came to Jesus that he implored Jesus. Think about your prayer life. When we have those things that are upon our hearts, oftentimes we'll bring them to Jesus and we'll drop them at the feet of Jesus and walk on. And and Jesus hears our prayers. But this man was so desperate for God to act that in the midst of praying, the scripture says that he implored him and he implored him and he implored him. He begged Jesus. What does our praying say about our belief that Jesus is the only solution? What does our praying say about our trust that there is no one who can help us like Jesus can and there is no one who can provide the strength and the hope that we need like Jesus. This man understood that without Jesus there was no hope, that without Jesus there was nothing that could be done. So he comes to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I beg you, I beg you, my son needs you. I earnestly implore of you. And there was a desperation that was within him. So we seek Jesus, y'all. We've got to come to a point in our lives where we don't seek him in a casual manner. But with desperation, we say, as the psalmist said, O God, thou art my God, early will I seek thee. My soul longs for thee. My flesh thirsts for thee in a dry and weary land. We come to that moment in time in our lives where we recognize there is nothing that will satisfy like Jesus. We come to a moment in our lives where we say, you know what? It doesn't matter whether it's a good day or a difficult day. It doesn't matter if the day makes sense or the day makes no sense. We desperately need Jesus. And the first decision we should make every single moment of our lives is that we are going to seek Jesus and seek him alone. By the way, in verse 48, there's kind of a parenthesis. You hear me say that often. Let me put a parenthesis and just kind of help you understand something real quick or let's talk about something. This man came begging for Jesus to help, and Jesus looked, and there was a crowd that was there. And the crowd had gathered, and we know from scriptures that the crowd gathers for many different reasons. Some gather around because they just want to see a good show, a miracle worker. And Jesus speaks to them, speaks to the crowd, not to the man who came seeking help, but he says, you all, he says, I want you all to understand that unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. And Jesus is condemning them. Because what Jesus wants us to do is not come to him because of what we need him to do. We need to come to him because of who he is. It doesn't matter whether he ever does anything else for us. He is worthy of worship. It doesn't matter whether it's a good day or a difficult day. He's worthy of worship. It doesn't matter whether the day makes sense or no sense. He's worthy of worship and we should come to him because he is the Lord. Because he is the only one who is perfect. He is the only one who can provide hope. This past week, I was reading back through the book of Job, thinking about some possible sermons in the future. And I love the story of Job. Here's Job whose crops were taken from him. After his crops were taken, his house was taken from him. After his house was taken from him, some of his family was taken from him. And in all honesty, the only thing he was left with were three pretty crummy friends. 
Uh, they weren't there to encourage or strengthen him. They were there to provide as much difficulty as some of the other things in life. By the way, there's a whole series of sermons there on picking wisely your friends, but that's for another day. But Job says this. Naked I came into the world, and naked I will leave. Here's what he said. Didn't have anything when I got here? It looks like. Now, this is, this is Thomas's interpretation of Job. You ready? He says, I didn't have anything when I got here, and the way things are going, it looks like I'm going to be leaving the same way. But then he says this. But blessed be the name of the Lord. He reminds us that, that God's name is not to be praised. That Jesus is not worthy of worship for the things that he does. He's worthy of worship for who he is. And you and I should gather in a place like this. And we should consistently praise God for who he is. And seek after him because he is the Lord of lords. Because he is our only hope. Because he is the one who has made a way so that we can be saved. We come to him. And so we seek Jesus. I'm always careful about using stories of encounters with uh, challenging people. Perhaps it's a good way to say it. But this happened many years ago. I had a student who came to me. And I've always told my students, if you have challenges, there anything I can help you with, if I can pray with you, come to me. So it's been about 15 years. I had a student who came to me and who said this. He said, um, I'm in a very difficult situation. I don't know what to do. And I said, well, tell me exactly what's going on. So he laid it all out in front of me. And I'd walked through a similar situation before. So here's what I said. Here's what you need to do. When you go back, you need to do these things. And I said three things. So I see him the next morning. He walks up to me. And the first thing he says is this. I got fired last night. I said, you got fired did you do what I suggested you do? And by the way, my words are not infallible. I think there's some wisdom with age and experience. And I said, did you do what I suggested you do? And he goes, no, I didn't. But what should I do now? I felt like saying, maybe we should rewind and you should do what I ask you to do first. But now it's a little late, so you're on your own. Here's the point, y'all. When we come to Jesus, when we seek him, and, and I'm not comparing myself to Jesus, so get over that. But, but when we come to Jesus and we seek after him, it's not just seeking him, but it's also then trusting him. And that's the second reminder that's here. We not only seek him, but we trust him. It means that we come to him and we lay our lives before him. And whatever he says is right, whatever he tells us, we do. And we respond as he wants us to do. We don't take our decisions in our life into our own hands. Imagine this. The Roman government official comes and he begs Jesus. Jesus, you're the only one that can help. Jesus, you're the only one that can help. And then he says this. It's in the scripture we just read. Verse 49, he says this. Come, come down. In the very next verse, you know what Jesus says? You go. <laughs> Have you ever come to Jesus? Have you ever been at a point in your life where you say, Jesus, I'm seeking you, and Jesus says, this is what you're going to do, and you say, well, Jesus, this is my plan. And Jesus says, if you trust me, you will do what I tell you to do, and that is to go. When we lay our concerns and our directions and our thoughts before God, and we say, God, this is what I want you to do, if we really trust Jesus, and when he speaks to us and he tells us what he wants us to do or who he wants us to be, by the way, it's oftentimes changes in our character and life. When he says, this is what you need to do, there's a moment of crisis. It's called a crisis of faith. It's a crisis of whether we're going to do what we think is right or whether we're going to trust Jesus. Listen, y'all. We can seek Jesus, but if we're not careful, we're not trusting him. We can come to him and say, God, we need your intervention. We need it. And God says, I hear you. Trust me. Depend upon me. Listen to me. Let me work in your life. Let me show you the ways that I'm going to do things that you couldn't imagine. Trust me. And until we come to the point where we honestly are individuals who trust him, to completely come to a moment where we say, God, I'll do whatever you call us to do. I'll be the person you want us to be. Until we do that, listen, y'all, we're really not seeking after Jesus. 
Because to seek Jesus means that we're going to trust him. It means that we're going to take him at his word. It means that when we don't hear him speak, that we're going to sit quietly and listen for the still, small voice of God that speaks into us, that gives us life and direction. You know, Mary understood this the last time they were in Cana. You remember the wedding feast? They were there that day, and they had had a great celebration of a wedding, a most joyous time. Jesus and his disciples were there. And the scripture says that they ran out of wine. And Mary knew that this was a crisis. And so Mary, Mary goes to the head servant, and here's what she says. You do whatever he says. And by the way, there's a lot of things that Mary had wrong at this point. Perhaps she didn't understand completely everything that was going on. But her words are a vivid reminder to us that if we're going to trust Jesus, we don't pick and choose what we want to do. When we say, Jesus, come, and he says, go, we say, your words are all that matter. We will trust you. We're reminded, and we've said this several times in this place. There's two groups of people. People who are experiencing crisis or people who are about to experience crisis. That's where we're at. It's not a matter if crises are going to come. We live in a world in which crises continually come. The question is, how are we going to deal with it? How are we going to handle it? What I want to urge you to do today is don't try to handle it yourself. Don't try to come up with the most spiritual thing you can do or think. Go to Jesus. Let him be the one that we seek. Let him be the one that we trust. And listen, y'all. Jesus said, go. And the man had to say, I trust the words of Jesus. And there's going to come a point in your time, every single one of us repeatedly, where we're going to have to come to a moment in our lives where we trust the words of Jesus. Where we say, Jesus, if you said it, that settles it. Some of y'all are old enough to remember the old saying that says, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. I understand the sentiment of that, but the reality is, God said it, that settles it. We, we act because he speaks. Listen to this. You can trust the word of God when Jesus says this, when the scripture tells us, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The scripture tells us that all we have to do is believe. And you can trust the fact that all you have to do is just believe and suddenly salvation is yours. The scripture tells us, Jesus himself said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You know what never means? Never. You're never alone. You never have to worry about being left alone. Jesus also told us, he says, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. There's a promise that's right there. Listen to this. It's an Old Testament passage in Isaiah. Isaiah 43 verse 2 says this. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they'll not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you'll not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you. Listen, y'all. We can trust the words of Jesus. Now, I'll leave this in closing. I have a couple of things I want to leave with you in closing. First of all, you'll notice in verse 50, he says, go, and he went. And as he went, the miracle occurred in his life. Obedience is a sign that you trust God. Now, I always want to make sure you know this, and I, I've said this several times. I know that we've talked about this before. A part of coming to Jesus and seeking him and a part of trusting him is trusting him with the answer as well. In this case, a miracle occurred. In this case, he went home and he found his son alive. And I'm convinced that God still does miracles. As a matter of fact, in all honesty, everything God does is a miracle. But there are times when we don't know with our minds what God is doing. 
And we may be seeking after a miracle, and we come to God and we say, God, please do this, and we lay it out. And God says, just trust me. And I want to tell you those are hard days. I've experienced them in my life. I've experienced them with my family as well. But my testimony is simply this. When we come to God, we seek Him because He is all-knowing, all-compassionate, perfect in every way. We don't seek him because of what he can do for us. We seek him because of who he is. And he is a God that we can take all this stuff and lay at his feet and be confident without any question that any way he works is right. It's not fatalism. It's not determinism. It's trust. Trust God. I told you before. I wanted my father to be healed. But he wasn't. It wasn't an indication that God was not at work. It was an indication that God was very much at work as he worked through his life. So I beg you today, I encourage you, you can trust Jesus. Seek him and trust him. Before we close, let me, let me, just, let me just challenge you. There may be some of you either listening or here today who are struggling to trust Jesus. And sometimes the struggle is because the challenge is so real. I understand that. God understands that. But there may be some today who are struggling to trust Jesus because you've never made a decision to trust him with your life. The beginning is a step of faith, just believing. The beginning of a walk with Jesus is where you come and you say, Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I'll, I want to follow you. I want to trust you with my life. And you may be struggling today because you've never made that first decision. And listen, you'll continue to struggle until you make that first decision. But you can do that today. You can trust. You can believe today. After our service is over, if God's speaking to you, by the way, you can do that by just saying, God, I believe. I trust you. After the service is over, our staff is going to be scattered around campus, and you can find any of us, and we'd love to talk with you about how Jesus can change your life. Would you join me as we pray? God, thank you. Thank you for who you are. God, I'm, I'm aware that when we look at passages like this, that it, it's a heaviness that falls upon us. I pray today, Father, you would just remind us that you are the answer. And that we can trust you with our lives. Trust you with the wisdom that we need. Trust you with our family and friends. And I pray, God, as we draw this service to a close, that you would hear us speak those words to you, just saying, God, I seek you. God, I trust you. I pray, Father, you'd hear the prayers of your children in this place. And as they seek after you, as they trust you, I pray, God, that you would reveal yourself to them and that they would discover over and over again that you have been faithful. God, I ask you to speak and comfort, encourage and strengthen. Thank you for meeting us in this place, Father. Continue to speak, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. I'm going to ask you to join us in standing, and as you stand, I'm going to ask you to let this closing song be your... Your cry to Jesus that he would help you turn your eyes upon him.
seated. We want to thank you so much for being here today. Just a, a couple of reminders on your way out. Our fall festival will be this Saturday from 10 to noon, and we could still use help with volunteers, and we could still use help with more candy. If you have not signed up to volunteer for that event, uh, you can uh, find Dale right after if you're here on our, on our campus, or you can email us at connect at metairiebc.org, and we'll make sure to find a place for you to get plugged in. If you want to drop off any candy throughout the week at our church office, we'll be available and ready to receive that as well. We are excited about that opportunity that God will give us this weekend to really just have an opportunity to serve our community and have a lot of fun as well. Also, we have been asked, and we're going to host another blood drive in just a couple of weeks on November 9th, and there will be more information on our website and on Facebook tomorrow morning about how you can sign up for that. Uh, I think I can speak for our entire church staff by saying we love you. We're glad you're here. We're here for you. We want to be able to connect with you in any way that we can to be able to pray for you. So if you will email us, call us, find us right after the service, and we'd love to talk to you more. Let us pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for an opportunity to be in this place. God, I pray that in all things that we'll seek you, that we'll trust you. God, I pray that this week the gospel will be always in our heart and always on our lips as we encounter those around us to declare the hope that we have in you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.